Welcome to another episode of Let Go and Lead, where we discuss the new realities of leadership with pioneers, provocateurs, and passionate leadership champions. Today, we're with Jay Silveria, Executive Director of Texas A&M's Bush School of Government and Public Service in Washington, D.C. Jay is also a retired Air Force general and a combat-tested fighter pilot. His breadth of leadership experience spans over 40 years and took him all over the world. I hope you enjoy spending time with him as much as I did. So let's get comfortable and get ready to let go and lead. Hi, Jay. It's so great to have you on Let Go and Lead. Well, hi, Meryl. It's so good to be here. Thank you. Thank you. You know, um, generally, our guests include corporate leaders, well-known authors. We talk to a lot of very different people, but not often military leaders. So I'm really excited to be having this conversation. Well, I, I when you said corporate leaders and well-known authors, I mean, so that so you know, how'd you end up with me? So <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's going to take long for our listeners to figure out how we ended up with you. <laughs> you know, you're a retired Air Force general, a combat-tested fighter pilot. I mean, I, it's just amazing. I understand you led air wars over Afghanistan, Syria, and Iraq. You've also led two university settings at the United States Air Force Academy and now Texas A&M. So I think we're going to have a lot to talk about. Yeah, there's, there is a lot there. I, I think that just means I've been sticking around for a while, Meryl. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're very grateful that you have. And of course, thank you for your service. Well, thank you. I mean, all of it was a privilege. It's all a privilege. As an Air Force pilot, you spent a career navigating high pressure situations. And, you know, many times you had to make split second decisions. And I'm curious, how has that actually affected your leadership approach? I think the preparation taught me that uh, as a leader uh, in, in aviation, you're always thinking about contingencies. You're always thinking about uh, pr preparing for an emergency. You're always thinking about how, what's going to go wrong and what am I going to do if this goes wrong? And I I think I've carried that over into my into my leadership in a lot of cases that I see it as my responsibility to think for the organization about, about what are our contingencies, what are things, what are things that that could go wrong. Uh, I also think that there's a uh, early on in my career, I flew with uh, someone that was uh, quite a bit older, probably a little crustier that uh, that taught me a principle that when uh, he, he said that. When, when in, in any combat situation or even in a heavy training situation where someone refers to a threat that is, you know, on the left-hand side. And, and he asked me, well, you know, what are you going to do? And I'm like, well, I, I mean, I'm going to look over there. I'm going to assess what we're going to. And he says, nah, you're going to look the other way because everybody's going to look that way. You need to look the other way for what something that somebody's not looking for, that's not, that they're not preparing for, that they're not paying attention to. Everybody else is gonna look where it's been called for. It's the, it's, it's gonna pull everyone's attention. It's the soccer ball in a kid's field. Everyone's gonna go that way. You need to look the other way. And, uh, and I've never forgotten that lesson. And that's, that's helped me a number of times. So, uh, so Meryl, I carry a lot of those fighter pilot lessons uh, into leadership. Yeah, I love that. Look the other way, because, of course, that's contrary to what we always hear. Right. <laughs> right. right. It's absolutely. Yeah. Contrary. And and then you can see it all in so many cases where something comes up and everybody starts diving in where they think they're helping or assisting or something. And 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 you miss you miss other things. And, and yeah, I've, I've taken that away. What's an example of that that? you've encountered in your now in your more civilian life? Well, I think uh, one of the examples, I, I think it can also, it serves in distraction, right? And so I see it in, I see it in education. I see it where, uh, a, say, a particular incident or student or something happens. And, and people are quick to jump to that particular episode or incident uh, and and either offer or, or want to help or offer an opinion or, or and and it distracts them from the fact that say in in my example of of students right now, what about all the other students? You know they need just as much of attention and just as much support and just as much uh, um, you know consideration as the one that is drawing the attention 
at the moment. Just because they're drawing attention because of uh, of, a, of grades or behavior or, or finances or, or support for whatever reason, doesn't mean that the other students don't need attention. And so I'm I'm quick to use that in an academic setting where we can focus too much some time on an individual or a couple individuals because of one element in our school where there's all the other students that we're not talking to, that we're not paying attention to. And so so a day-to-day, sometimes if that comes up, I'll ask, well, hey, what about this other student? What about this other element? And 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 I, they're now used to me doing it. So people will look, will already have some of the other information, but something will come up and, you know, they'll worry about this happened to a student or this is a concern for a student. Well, how many other students have the concern? How, how do we know? You know, what else have we looked at that's the other direction? This is going to stick with me for a long time. I like this whole concept. Look the other way. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it stuck with me for decades, Meryl. It has stuck with me for decades. And I've had some, you know, in when some really bad things have happened when we lost somebody or something and 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 I don't I maybe I've trained myself into this where and people are focused so much on that okay, because it's it you know, it's horrible uh, to lose somebody, but we still have a lot of people with us and a lot of responsibilities and 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 a lot of and a lot of things that we have to continue to focus on. I want to go back to the split second decision making, and you mentioned it takes a lot of preparation. I would imagine a lot of the preparation is through drills, or is that right? Yeah, I guess preparation is is probably a pretty broad term. I would say repetition. Uh, I I think one of the the difference uh, about the United States military that really makes it the best in the world is the quality of the training and and the highest most demanding training environments. And I'll use air air combat training for, as an example. Uh, at one one point in my career, I was the commander of Nellis Air Force Base where we would bring uh, thousands of people in repeatedly through the year uh, and large air combat exercises with uh, on a range that had simulated threats, a um, hundred good guys, and then we'd have bad guy airplanes and simulated uh, combat. And uh, uh, you repeatedly, repeatedly when you showed up there, you've just got your butt kicked. I mean, you 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 did not breeze through the event, and in fact, it was designed so that if we saw units that were starting to have an amount of success, we would just dial it up, and we would make it harder. We would make it more complex. So that that preparation is so important. That repetition and the demanding training it, it's it's what makes us the best. And how do you see that replicated in the corporate world or a university setting? Well, I think one of the things that in uh, either in the corporate world or the university setting, one of the the things that we do, the me, we meaning the military do that I try to bring over is is the uh, you know the ideas of deep learning through review and and debrief and and consideration, lessons learned after after the fact. And so I think in, in corporate America and, and in higher ed, uh, and in, in where I'm at, we try to, even the smallest events and, and the smallest uh, uh, you know, accomplishments or milestones, to have a review of, of what we did and how we got there. And, and, I, and that's, that deep learning aspect is not unique to the military, but uh, it was something that made us that that made us as good as we were. I think one of the I think one of the challenges there is to is to not do it when something goes well, and and you know to be so entirely outcome driven that if the outcome is 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 either as you expected or better than you expected, there's a tendency to not want to review it or not to want to to go after, uh, to find yourself accountable or others accountable or look for ways to improve because we met or exceeded. Uh, I think that's a trap because it doesn't allow you or the organization to actually get better. Now, that's a really good point. You know, how do you make great even greater? Right. <laughs> and learn from right. that. Yeah. <laughs> and I can hear it. I can hear it sometimes when 
we when we uh, achieve an element and then want to have a review or a uh, a debrief or or you know whatever word uh, the the organization's using, and and when you met the goals and everybody wants to really pat themselves on the back, but you know we we'll we'll be there next month, we'll be there next year, we'll be there next cycle, and and it'll be just as demanding and just as challenging next time, and we should we should take the chance to to learn from those. I think it's also great because it gives people an opportunity to reflect on what they did do well, which we don't spend enough time on sometimes. Yeah. Well, it also, you find, uh, uh, I, I, what I've seen over the years is you also find the times when you got lucky, right? <laughs> right. If you acknowledge, if you acknowledge, okay, that turned out great, but, but it wasn't due to us or it wasn't due to, you know, it was, it was lucky. So I, and, and that comes out. Yeah, no, that's right. And I know, you know, now we're kind of starting to talk about the area of culture. And um, I think, you know, at Gaga McDonald, we do a lot of work in that area. I realize that military really focuses on its culture as well. And I was just wondering, like, what are some of the things that you see that you can pull forward into what you're doing now that helps create a culture of innovation or accountability? Some of those areas. I think uh, I, I maybe I depart from the norm a little bit on the area of encouraging uh, innovation and, and say that improvement uh, that we were just talking about is that I think there's probably a general feeling that that should come from a bottom up. And, and uh, what I've seen and what I, my experience is that it doesn't happen unless it's, unless it's top down. Unless, unless the leader allows the organization to be innovative, allows people to, to experiment, to make mistakes, to, to, to venture off and, and to consider other, other ideas, unless, unless the, the leadership of the organization allows that to happen and presents, presents that culture that it's, that it's okay, that it's okay to be innovative because it's okay to fail, because it's okay to try things. Um, because it's okay to seed and and try things that we haven't tried before, unless the senior leaders do that, uh, then 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 people are hesitant. You know, they may they may be hesitant in their own in their own decision making, but if they don't get sort of call it permission in the culture that it's okay to try that. I worked for a boss once that I've carried forward uh, who would say, "There's a hundred percent chance." that we don't have this 100% right. And that and that came from him down which gave you permission to recognize oh we we have to keep improving and we have to we have to continue to to be innovative and we're allowed to allowed to be innovative. What are some of the best ways you've seen to encourage that? I think incentivizing the behavior that you see and that you want and publicly rewarding that that it, the innovation and the, and the steps that you see, I mean, I, I think that's really valuable. One of the things that I'm seeing a lot is that people just don't have the time to really think or to explore or to play, that they're on such a hamster wheel that in under so much stress that it's almost like their whole cerebral cortex shuts down, right? It's all like the amygdala driving, like get it done, get it done, get it done. Yet innovation takes space. Oh, absolutely. And I'm just wondering what you think of that or how do you create the space? We're too busy, so we can't can't do any planning, which just actually makes it worse, right? I mean, it just makes your situation worse if you're not planning because planning allows you to set priorities. I think one of the ways to for senior leadership to get out of that hamster wheel is to focus on the things that only the senior leader can do, which is to provide that direction, provide the vision, provide that 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 planning that the organization can use. President Reagan used to say that uh, you know, and I'll paraphrase it and botch it, but a uh, uh, lions don't chase chipmunks. <laughs> Because it's not worth the calories. It's not yeah. worth the calories that a lion expends to, to 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 take down a chipmunk. And and as the story goes, again, I'll paraphrase it wrong, that he would point to 
he would point to his, you know, chief of staff, James Baker, and say, you know, he handles the chipmunks, <laughs> so, which is which is that point exactly that he should be taking on the big responsibilities that he had and not getting stuck on the smaller items. No, I, I was just curious what you thought about it. And it, I think it is all about prioritizing. It's just what I'm really trying to do in my own organization and encouraging clients is to build in space, just to build space for whatever may come, because we just don't allow it. When you look at how we build capacity, how we do all these different things, we do it based on what is known and giving no latitude for what's going to come. I think you're also hitting on how an organization builds resilience uh, for for the organization, right? You build that resilience by having that space so that you're, you, as you mentioned, you have the space to, to act, the, the space to respond. Uh, if you have yourself, you know, even just take a, a, a simple uh, concept of the scheduling of your days and weeks. And, you know, if you've taken up your entire, you know, every minute of every hour of every day, then you have no ability to respond or react to things that are brought to you that that you didn't know. That's a great point. It's also how you can capitalize on opportunities. Yeah, that that's a really good point that you use it when you see opportunities, not just not just uh, handling things that were unexpected. Yeah. This kind of leads me to a question I was thinking about in terms of in combat, you would have faced really intense physical and mental demands. And how do you prepare for that and have the resiliency and probably also the vulnerability to really get through that? I would fall back on what I mentioned before about the repetition uh, that that gives you confidence uh, for for the situations and and the the demanding. I, you did mention the physical nature of it, the demanding physical uh, nature of it, you know, despite what the movies will tell you, uh, uh, that kind of demanding physical environment, uh, is, is very much for, uh, young men and women. It's a reality that, that, uh, it, you have to prepare for, you have to condition yourself for, you have to, you have to work for the vulnerability uh, is such an important aspect that a lot of, a lot of pilots, uh, will, will, you know, quip that, you know, when, when I see, when I see something you know, in the airplane or I see something go wrong, my first assumption has to be, my first assumption has to be that there's pilot error. Okay, whatever it is, I've caused it. And now I need to figure out what I need to do to undo what I did. And first assumption has to be pilot error. Always assume pilot error. If you fall back from that, okay, no, I didn't do this. uh, Then then you can react accordingly. But I think that you can call it a vulnerability or a humility but there's a recognition uh, that that you may have missed something, and you may you there's something you may not have noticed, you may not be aware of for for whatever reason. Reason, what am I missing? And so I I think there's that inane vulnerability that you have to have, or humility, or recognition that that you're you're just not going to see absolutely everything. And I guess one comforting thing in that is if it's your error, you can adjust. (laughs) If it's a problem with the plane, you might be in trouble. (laughs) That's right. That's right. If I assume that I made the mistake, then uh, yeah, that's a good starting point. (laughs) One of the things I'm going to tilt to here is um, there was an amazing speech that you gave to Air Force cadets around racism. Mm-hmm. And, and it, I remember it went viral. I mean, it was absolutely incredible. And I'd just love to ask you a little bit about that. Okay. So this was a situation where there were racial slurs, I think, written on a wall or... Yeah, let me build it, build that uh, picture a little bit. So in uh, the dormitories of the prep school, which is uh, um, about 250 students that are in a prep school pro, uh, before they joined the academy. It's on the grounds of the Air Force Academy. And someone had written a racial slur on uh, the little whiteboard that that uh, most dorms have where someone oh. writes a message, you know, stopped by to see you or, you know, yep. meet for dinner or, or at six or whatever on a little white dry erase whiteboard. Kind of. And they were on and uh, they wrote it on the board, a racial slur telling all the African-American students 
uh, to go home. And they wrote it down down the hall on 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 uh, those those students' uh, doors. And so, uh, and you can imagine uh, the reaction normally uh, to something like that, both by parents and by students and social media, et cetera. But uh, I also think it's important to mention the context. I mean, the context at the time uh, after Ferguson, uh, the riots in Ferguson and uh, the uh, riots in Charlottesville, uh, Virginia. Um, so there, the context was that, uh, I guess, charged environment or charged atmosphere regarding race relations. And so I, I felt like I needed to say something about it uh, to the cadets publicly and and to make it known, I guess, where I stood on it and and where 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 I thought the organization should stand on this because and and we can talk a little bit more about this element of it. I was hurt. I mean, that institution is my institution. Yeah. I'm an alum of the of the institution. Uh, it isn't just that I worked there. I'm an alum. Uh, it's what was said was, was very, was something that, that hurt me, uh, that I uh, very much disagreed with. So I had an emotional response to that as well. Uh, so, uh, I wanted to, I wanted to, to, you know, I guess, set the record straight on, on how I think we and the organization and how I should react. So I made the speech that you're referencing to that's about, um, a little over five and a half minutes long. And uh, it was recorded, and uh, and then by that afternoon, that evening, the next morning, it was it was all over all over the internet, uh, going going viral. My son called me and told me, "Dad, you are trending number two on YouTube right after some cat video." What I I thought was so powerful about it is how you tapped into people's self-respect of you should be outraged yeah you know i th- I thought that was so powerful and the whole of course repetition of if you don't believe this you need to leave <laughs> there were there were some very interesting um communication frameworks in that i that were so powerful the in, the other thing and i'm i'd encourage everybody really to google this and look at it was how all of your leaders were up front. You had a term for it on the stage, the something yeah, stage. Yeah, the, the tower, um, the staff tower the, is what it's called, yeah. The staff tower, and then you had the move around the room. I, you sent them to the rail, I think is what you called it. But the symbolism of that was really striking. And, and I'm just curious, what made you think to do that? I sent a note to my direct reports and, and the other senior leaders of the academy and said, this has happened and I'm going to talk to the cadets at lunch, which is really the only time that that you can bring all of the cadets together. Um, it's uh, If no one's been to a military service academy and seen that, it's the same at Annapolis and West Point at, at the, an appointed hour in, at lunch. Uh, 4,400 people come together and eat lunch in 20 minutes and leave. It's a, it's really remarkable. But uh, wow. so they were all assembled. And I told all of my direct reports, please come support me uh, with this message that I'm going to deliver to the cadets. And, and in a lot of ways, Meryl, it chokes me up now because I don't know, a thousand people showed up. I talked about the tower, but and we had hundreds of people up on the tower who showed up, but there were so many people that along the side, this is a huge dining facility that houses 4,000 people to eat lunch at once, but they were lined along the walls on both sides, you know, many people deep along the both sides and at the tower. I mean, it was, it was absolutely packed and the cadets had to be there. But the rest of those people didn't have to be there. And there's a, a point in the speech where I say that this this is this is about us. That you know, we 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 cannot allow someone to write a write something on a board 
and and define us. They, they don't get to do that. They're not, you know, they they they're not allowed to do that. They can't write on a board and tell us what we stand for. And so, and I, and I remember saying something along those lines and about the fact that, you know, we're all here to represent. So that's one of the moments that I was, that I was most proud of. Yeah, it was such a galvanizing moment and such a symbolic one. You know, as you were leading the air war in Iraq and Syria, you went from that situation to becoming the leader of the United States Air Force Academy. And that must have been a big shift, I would imagine, was it? In some ways, it, it was a huge shift. Uh, in in other ways, it was it, it was not. Um, uh, in and then I think there's probably a, a, a there's a another part of it that I think it was important to have come from that setting to understand. For these young men and women are not just going to school; they're they're on their way to serve, and so there's very much a uh, I, an empathy with knowing what they're on their way to do. And so that gave me, a, I guess, a different perspective or a, a different responsibility about how these young men and women were prepared because I had just come from there. So there's a yeah. responsibility of knowing where they're, where they're going. I remember arriving and meeting some of the seniors that were on their way the first classmen they're called at the academy that uh, to leave that they were, you know, that year going to graduate and thinking about you know what was in front of them. So I, I remember those those thoughts. Well, one of the things that's hugely different is the number of constituencies, and it's the same across higher ed. But oh my gosh, this is parents. And and you know the the students and the faculty and the commun the local community. This is uh, legislators. Uh, this is uh, um, individual members of of Congress who nominate and and their staffs and 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 as well as the uh, the Pentagon and the uh, the air staff and, and the budget budgetary control there and and then as well as you know my direct immediate reports the Secretary of the Air Force and the Chief of Staff. Of the Air Force, in the course of a day, we'll get letters from from parents, uh, uh, discuss with a board, talk to the local community, talk to their own employees and staff and faculty, talk talk to students. Uh, the number of constituencies and those concerns that you have to that you have to balance and 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 consider in, in as as the organization moves forward uh, that. That is is different, and in a lot of ways, was was something that took me a bit to get used to. And how did you really learn the different concerns of all those constituencies? I think my my leadership approach has always been uh, as someone who's open and and accessible. Uh, it was prior to that, and and I I made myself uh, uh, you know open and accessible to all. Of those, uh, all of those elements, and so with parents and and alum groups and and other uh, uh, Air Force Academy graduates that are assembled in different ways as business leaders, I continued that approachable and and accessible way of of doing business. I mean, I had I had office hours down with the cadets and allowed anyone to make an appointment, and I had hours with staff and faculty and allowed any of them. Uh, to make an appointment. That's something I, I did before. It's something I do now uh, and uh, with the students. And, and I think that that was how I learned the, the concerns and how I learned to, to look for the connections of, of what people needed and, and what the organization needed to focus on. Now, it is staggering the number of constituencies that you have, and of course now at Texas A&M as well, and I was on the board for many years of American University, and I just found it staggering what the staff, President Burwell and her staff had to deal with. I mean, you because you're dealing with restaurants, hotels, security, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's like all what real estate. I mean, it's just crazy, and 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 then of course there's this important thing called education. <laughs> <laughs> right. I and I think uh, one of the things that's fascinating to me about uh, higher ed, and not not that I've even been doing it for a little bit, 
is just what you described is, uh, you know, it's an it's an education, uh, you know, uh, an institute of uh, institution of higher education. Well, it, if you view it that way, uh, there's a difference between it's a, a it's a business that provides education as opposed to it's a, an educational institution, because it's easy to forget the fact that if those if that physical plant that you described uh, yeah. it, it isn't working and it, if the if no one can manage you know the ability to feed students in in the right amount of time I mean if you can't manage that then then how your how the classroom the quality in the classroom and what's being delivered in the ca- classroom uh, is affected. You know, the expectations are that, you know, you're going to, you're going to lower tuition and balance the budget and bring in more students and raise the salaries of the staff and, and fix all the deferred maintenance and, uh, and give a few more days off if you can throw that in. I mean, the expectations are just so high. And now with all the mental health and well being, that's another huge expectation that's much greater than it used to be. Right. And a tough one. I completely agree. No, it's that's really interesting. So, so tell me a little bit about what you are doing at Texas A and M. Well, I, I was fortunate enough when I left the Air Force Academy, uh, I uh, uh, had an opportunity to join Texas A and M. The Bush School of Government and Public Service has been in College Station for 25 years, and had always wanted to open a location in Washington D.C. So uh, I, I took on that task for the Bush School. I met two other people on a sidewalk at a high rise in downtown Washington, D.C. And we started the Bush School uh, in, and that was in the fall of 2020. Um, in January Interesting of 21. Interesting timing. <laughs> no kidding. Well, I tell you, our first, our first event that we were supposed to have our uh, students that were starting that semester I was on January 6th of 21. And so, and, and then the following week, when we couldn't have an event on January 6th of 21, because we were inside the security perimeter following the, uh, the riot around the Capitol, we were inside the security perimeter. So then the next week when we couldn't have it, we had a major blizzard in Washington, D.C. So we're starting to feel like, you know, maybe there's an omen here that, but we started that semester with uh, 12 students in 21. And in uh, wow. in August uh, this year, we will, right, based on all of our, our administrators, we're going to have over 100 students in August. And uh, we've we have grown so, uh, so fast. And it's uh, graduate studies only. Uh, students that are mostly working professionals in the city, uh, in the national security enterprise, in the intelligence community, in international affairs in Washington, D.C., and uh, some of them are coming out of undergrad into graduate studies. A lot of them are working, and they are they are drawn to the legacy of President Bush. I mean, right on our wall when you walk in, that public service is a noble calling, which you know grabs me every time I walk in. And they're drawn to that. They're drawn. They're propensed to serve. And they want to be part of of serving uh, serving their country uh, in a lot of ways. In that same environment, I was around in the military. So they're remarkable, remarkable people. We talked a little bit earlier about an innovation and a culture of innovation. It's, it, it's so uh, enjoyable to be part of a, in an environment where that the innovation is, 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 is not just expected. It's really required because everything we're doing is in the, in a startup element in, in a startup way. And so in, you don't know what's going to work. You don't, and you don't know if it's going to work. And you have to have an attitude, as I mentioned, that we don't have this all right, and and be quick to say, well, we didn't have that right, and let's change, and let's add, and let's adapt, and 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 or remove, and and so that's a neat environment to be in. Well, you sure had an absolutely fascinating career. <laughs> It's I'm just so fantastic. Lucky, yeah. I'm the luckiest, yeah. luckiest person around, Meryl. Absolutely. I'm going to ask you one more question, which I ask all our guests. And, you know, the, the title of this podcast is Let Go and Lead. What do you, do you feel that there is anything leaders need to let go of? And if so, what is it? Oh, my gosh, there is. And it, it's, I mean, right in the forefront, it's, uh, it's fear, Meryl. It, it's fear. When I talk to younger leaders, I talk about uh, a lesson that I learned from what 
Teddy Roosevelt talked about, the man in the arena, that uh, which a lot of people focus on where he says, you know, it's, it's, it's not the critic, it's the man in the arena that matters. And a lot of people focus on the critic. Don't be a critic. It's, it's someone, it's the man in the arena. But I, I actually talk about it in different terms that, that uh, Teddy Roosevelt mentions later in that, in that often quoted passage about that you know, it's, it's the person in the arena who's getting dusty and dirty and bloody. And, and that's, that's the nature of, of, of leadership. I mean, you are going... You, things are going to go wrong. You are going to make mistakes. You're going to make missteps. You're going to forget. You're going to, you are subject to every human frailty that is imaginable and, and more just because, because that's who we are. We're human beings. And, and, and I think because of that, uh, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to get dirty and dusty and bloody, and it's going to sting and 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 not be great all the time, and and sometimes be wonderful and somebody. But you can't be afraid of that. You you can't you can't enter uh, any situation or concern that you know that with fear of what what if it doesn't go right or what if I don't get it wrong or I don't get it right I I make a mistake or someone makes a mistake. I, it, it's all going to happen. So. So don't lead with fear. Don't don't consider that and try to, uh, you know, push those fears away. And that's what I would I would tell anyone. You have to let go. You have to let go of that fear. No, that's wonderful. And, and fear, as we know, is contagious. Oh, my God. As is confidence. Uh, right? Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Both yeah. of them are. Well, Jay, this has been just fantastic. Thank you so much for your time and for joining us on Let Go and Lead. Oh, uh, thank you, Meryl. It's been wonderful. Thank you. And very nice to meet you. Great to meet you. I'm so thankful to Jay for joining us today. I valued his perspectives, humility, and memorable stories. He spent the first 35 years of his career in the military, and I appreciated how he translated those lessons and experience into corporate and higher ed environments. He's had such a fascinating career in vastly different worlds, but the constant thread throughout his leadership style is that he's a true servant leader, caring for the people under him. He invests his time in getting to know his people as a mission imperative. At Gagan, we take a people-focused approach to consulting, so Jay's leadership style really resonated with me. As one of our most seasoned leaders on the podcast, Jay had several perspectives that stood out. He said it's his responsibility to constantly think about contingencies, about what could go wrong, and minimize risk by planning ahead. Jay also talked about the importance of looking in the opposite direction of where most people are focused, to see what might otherwise be missed. He encouraged us to focus on the important areas or people that could go unnoticed, especially in a crisis. He also talked about the importance of reflecting on the lessons learned, not just when things go badly, but also when they go exceedingly well. We shouldn't miss the opportunity to study what went well and why. Jay also talked about how to foster innovation in an organization and shared the importance of allowing people to experiment, to make mistakes, and to venture off and consider other ideas. Innovative organizations have a culture where it's okay to try things, even if it fails. And since the title of this podcast is Let Go and Lead, I asked Jay what leaders should let go of. He said we need to let go of fear. We can't enter a situation fearing what might go wrong or fearing mistakes. I love how he put it. He said, you're subject to every human frailty imaginable because we're human beings and humans make mistakes. I think that's so true and we can't let fear stop us. I really enjoyed talking with Jay. His experiences as a military general are certainly unique, but there's so much carryover leading into other organizations. Remember to subscribe to Let Go and Lead on your favorite podcast platform and be the first to hear conversations and ideas from other thought-provoking leadership champions. Those include Julia Hobsbawm, writer and speaker on the future of work, Mark Miller, formerly Chick-fil-A's VP for High Performance Leadership, and Bonnie St. John, former Paralympian skier. And don't forget to check out archive interviews with Marshall Goldsmith, Howard Schultz, Seth Godin, and others. Thanks for joining, and see you on the next episode of Let Go and Lead. Thank you.